Huh? University of Bradford lecturer in archaeological and forensic sciences, Dr Shirley Curtis Summers, recently had a paper published in which she analysed the changing diets of a small Scottish community between the 6th and 7th centuries. Historians have been interested in investigating religious communities for some time, and they have used a wide array of primary sources to do so, including annals, laws, and the lives of saints. However, as Dr Curtis Summers notes in her article, these sources tend to lack the necessary detail to paint the full picture of everyday life, being, as they are, focused mostly on political events, religious administration, and saintly deeds. Essentially, they fail to illuminate the lives of everyday people. Over the last decade or so, however, historians have used the bones of medieval peoples to produce a fuller picture of the diets of the people of the past, using stable isotope analysis. This is what Dr Curtis Summers did in Port Mahumuk. Port Mahumuk is on the Tarbat Peninsula in northeast Scotland, where it overlooks the Dornoch Firth to the west, the Moray Firth to the south, and the Cromarty Firth to the southwest. It has long been known as a site of archaeological importance, as 18th century antiquarians observed carved stones there that portrayed both Pictish and Christian symbolism, and later it was discovered to be the site of an 8th century Pictish monastic settlement, which had once been home to a simple 8th century monastery, which eventually grew into an extended and restructured church by the 17th century, as the parish community grew around it. Under the church were buried 178 human skeletons of all ages. Radiocarbon dating revealed that these skeletons originated from between the mid-6th to late 17th centuries, and had been buried in a number of distinct chronological periods. The first period dated from 550 to 700 AD, and was represented by the burials of an adult Pictish lay group. This was followed by the burials of a predominantly male Pictish monastic group in periods 2 to 3, dating from 700 to 800 and 800 to 1100 AD, respectively. After this, period 4 from 1100 to 1600 CE saw a normal family group of men, women and children buried, and finally, a predominantly non-adult group in period 5 from 1600 to 1700 CE, which was when adult burials had shifted to outside the church. Focusing on the adult burials, Dr Curtis Summers carried out stable carbon and nitrogen isotope analysis on 97 of the adult skeletons, and combined the results with already established data from a pilot study on 40 adult bone samples from Port Mahumuk she had already analysed six years beforehand. Finding that the burials in periods 2 and 3 were chronologically and culturally very similar to each other, she decided to combine the data of the two periods together when talking about them, so she had 13 skeletons from period 1, 58 skeletons from period 2 to 3, and 64 skeletons from period 4, as well as 2 skeletons from period 5. She also used bone samples from 55 local faunal remains ranging from terrestrial to marine and freshwater species to provide a better faunal isotopic baseline for the reconstructions of the diets of the humans in the area. If you're wondering what exactly stable carbon and nitrogen isotope analysis is and how it helps reconstruct diets, let me explain. When you eat, Elements from your diet, such as carbon and nitrogen, are incorporated and preserved in your body's tissues, like the collagen in your bone and teeth. This allows scientists to measure the ratios of different isotopes in the collagen of the long dead in order to learn about their diets. However, when undertaking this process, scientists must be sure to take bone turnover into account. Over the course of a person's life, Bone is gradually broken down by cells called osteoclasts and replaced by new bone. The new bone won't carry the dietary history that the old bone had, and scientists need to be aware of this when attempting to use bones to investigate historical diets. The rate of bone collagen turnover differs greatly between cortical bones, also known as compact bones such as the femur, and trabecular bones, also known as spongy bones such as the rib. Trabecular bone collagen has a turnover of around 18% yearly, 
whilst cortical bone collagen has a much slower rate of turnover, at around 3% yearly. The rate of bone turnover is the main reason that Dr. Curtis Summers avoided studying the non-adult skeleton she found, as the rate of bone collagen turnover is much greater in children, from around 300% a year at birth to 19% and 35% a year for cortical and trabecular bones respectively, at the age of 15. Isotope ratios in children will, therefore, reflect a much shorter period of an individual's diet than it will in adults, at around 5 years of life for older children, and 20 years of life for adults. However, the enamel in teeth will not be replaced over time, making tooth enamel representative of the diet during crown formation. I have also included a video in the description of this video which details how stable isotope analysis is used to understand diets, so feel free to go and watch it if you want a better understanding of the process. Generally however, plants native to hot, arid environments follow the C4 photosynthetic pathway, and discriminate less against carbon-13 than C3 plants, which grow in more temperate regions. This leads to C4 plants having delta-13 carbon values of about minus 12.5 per mil, whereas C3 plants have delta-13 carbon values around minus 26.5 per mil. When it comes to the carbon isotope ratios of marine and freshwater organisms, however, there is greater variation depending upon the local ecological circumstances, and there is often overlap with those of terrestrial plants and their consumers. Usually, however, marine and freshwater foods have much higher nitrogen isotope values, as nitrogen levels go up by 2-3% for each step up the trophic level, and usually there are a higher number of trophic levels in aquatic food chains than terrestrial ones. Humans who consume terrestrial plants and animals usually have delta-15 nitrogen values of 6-10 to 10 per mil in bone collagen, whereas consumers of fresh water or marine fish, seals and sea lions can have delta-15 nitrogen values of 15-20 to 20 per mil. However, because of the numbers of variables, it is considered good practice to establish a site-specific isotopic baseline, often by analysing faunal remains from the area for comparison to the human remains. This is what Dr. Curtis Summers did. She took the 97 human and 55 faunal bones, and removed samples of them with bone clippers before cutting them with a stainless steel flexible dental saw with a diamond cutting edge. The samples were then prepared and analysed, and the results were placed into two tables, one for the humans, and one for the fauna, alongside the isotope ratios and information about each bone sample, including the period, sex, age at death, and bones sampled. When analysing the results, Dr. Curtis Summers found that there were two distinct groups visible. The adult remains of periods 1-3, to three, from the 6th to 11th centuries, had delta-13 carbon ratios and delta-15 nitrogen ratios that were significantly different to the remains of those from period 4 to 5, suggesting a drastic change in diet between the two periods. One of the most notable results Dr. Curtis Summers reached was that, when comparing the periods, the results suggested that minimal freshwater and marine fish were consumed by the Pictish lay and monastic communities in periods 1 to 3 compared to periods 4 to 5, and that data was supported by the fact that only a minuscule amount of aquatic bones were recovered from the site during excavation that dated to periods 1 to 3. But this raised the question, Port Mahumuk is a coastal community, so why were its inhabitants not eating fish during the earliest three periods? Taking a closer look at the data from period 1, the delta-13 carbon values of the 13 adult humans analysed from the period range between minus 21.2 per mil to minus 20 per mil, with a mean of 20.7 per mil, whilst the delta-15 nitrogen values range between 10 per mil to 13.1 per mil, with a mean of 11.3 per mil. Very few faunal bones were recovered from period 1, and no marine or freshwater fish bones were recovered, but the remains of barley and wheat was present. Altogether, 
This suggested a predominantly C3 plant-based diet with some terrestrial herbivore and omnivore protein from small-scale hunting mixed in. However, there was no evidence to suggest that the people from this period consumed fish. We will return to this group later. Looking at periods 2 to 3, there is very little evidence of fish consumption. However, in this case, fish consumption is present, although rarely indulged in. Specifically, one individual, SK144, had a noticeably higher Dalton Carbon 13 value than the rest of the adults found in the period, suggesting he consumed some marine and freshwater protein. It is possible that the monastic brethren in this community followed St. Benedict's fasting rule, which did not stipulate that meat could be replaced by fish on fasting days, and that SK-144 was some sort of senior monk with privileged rights to aquatic foods that were unavailable to most of the monastic brethren. Terrestrial protein was also likely consumed in greater quantities by the Pictish monks and their lay forebears, suggesting greater arable and pastoral farming in this period than period 1. In period 4, delta-13 carbon values and delta-15 nitrogen values are much higher, suggesting a drastic increase in the amount of fish being consumed, which is supported by fish bones from the period being found in greater quantities than in previous periods. This increase coincided with growing populations and an increase in the fish trade, partly connected to the growing widespread adherence to Christian fasting practices in Britain, with fish being stipulated as a meat replacement on fasting days, as St. Benedict's rule was replaced by the less strict St. Augustine's rule. The two adult samples from period 5 are the Presbyterian Tarbat parish minister, William Mackenzie, and his wife, whose delta-13 carbon values appear more comparable to those from period 2 to 3 than the majority of period 4. This was likely due to their diets having been influenced by their religion, with Presbyterian fasting days still being observed, but not stipulating fish as a replacement for meat on those days. So what about those lay picks from period 1 who don't appear to have consumed fish at all? We have plenty of evidence to suggest that the picks from this period had significant naval abilities, so the suggestion that they didn't know how to fish is not a likely one. A better explanation is that they actively avoided consuming fish. As Dr. Curtis Summers notes, We also know from Pictish stone carvings that salmon was a very important symbol for them, possibly derived from earlier superstitious and folklore beliefs that include stories about magical fish, such as the Salmon of Knowledge, believed to have contained all the wisdom in the world. It's possible that fish were considered so special by the Picts that consumption was deliberately avoided. However, a number of academics, including Dr. Curtis Summers herself, have urged caution in drawing conclusions too soon, as although we now know more about Pictish cultural practices than we used to, we still know very little, and we've got a long way to go before we truly understand these early medieval people. If you like this video and want to keep up to date with future videos, remember to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. I'll see you next time.